Okay, good evening. We want to start our ministry leaders Bible study. I'm sorry we're starting late. We had a little problem with um, our setup because of the weather, but thank God we made it. My name is Apostle Preston Mitchell. Uh, we're a powerhouse ministries, PO Box 1, Cary, North Carolina, 27512. You can find us on Ustream and YouTube channels, the Powerhouse 1, www.powerhouse.org, and Power Temple at MindSpring.com. Okay, tonight uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start our new year off, and what I want to do is, this is a subject I was going to teach last year, but because of scheduling conflicts, we can't get it, close it out, because I want you to start the new year off, and I'm not one that believes in New Year's resolutions or that things, but I just think that we need to look at ministry vision and purpose, and because I'm, I, you know, as I was praying, and some own personal uh, interactions, and talking with other leaders, people in ministry, people that have a desire to be in ministry, people that are in churches, assemblies, etc., there seems to be an issue with understanding vision and purpose for ministry. There is this belief that the, what the church's true purpose is, we've totally deviated away from that. And so tonight I'm just going to talk to you just for a little while about ministry, vision, and purpose. Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity. I pray now that the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon me afresh. I thank you now, God, that the words I say will not be of my words, that you would give me revelation knowledge, that the teaching would be clear, would come with clarity, purpose, and understanding. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. Okay, so what is vision? Okay, so vision is a sight, this is biblical, vision is a sight, i.e., by virtue of a dream. It's mentally. It's not natural. A vision is a sight that is mentally something that's seen in your head or your spirit, man. It can be the verse, the vision, uh, a dream. You can get revelation about something or an oracle through a vision. But most of all, what we're going to talk about is prophecy and divine communication. Because when God is about to do something or God births something, he normally does it through, a, through dreams and visions. If you look through the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets and the people would always have what? Dreams and visions. All the Old Testament prophets, they always had a dream or a vision, and then they would prophesy through divine communication. They heard from God. Their ear is to God's mouth. God speaks to them, and then they speak what God told them. This is very important for the body of Christ today, and the reason I'm saying it's very important is because we are dealing with a lot of subjects that are going to require us to encompass and depend on fivefold ministry. Okay, and when I'm talking fivefold ministry, I'm talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but more so than ever before, the apostolic minute, the gift of the apostle, and the gift of the prophet. These two gifts are very, 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 very needed and very important in the body of Christ. Because these are the two gifts that God normally used to give vision and to start purpose. Okay? So when we start talking about vision, how do we come to vision? Right? Proverbs 29 and 18. And this is very important about if you're going to launch or you're saying that God has given you a vision for a ministry or an assignment. You must have a vision. And that vision is going to come with what? Purpose. Okay, so Proverbs 29, 18, King James Version, what does it say? It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. We're going to look at the, the A clause. Where there is no vision, no revelation, no prophecy, divine communication, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. We have to have vision, because when we don't have divine communication... People perish. It's going to become clear in a few moments. Let's look at this same scripture, right, in a different version. Where there is ignorance of God, crimes run wild, but what a wonderful thing it is for a nation to know and keep his laws. What does it say again? Where there is ignorance of God, there is no prophetic vision. There is no um, prophetic or divine communication. There is no oracle. There is no dream. It, the ignorance of God, right, has to come through the believer or through the ministry that Christ left in the earth realm. C 
Crime runs wild, and we see that now in society. But we've seen it forever and ever and ever that crime runs wild. And one of the reasons that crime runs wild is because we, there is an ignorance of God. There is an absolute ignorance of God, of what God's purpose is and plan for people's life, and how we as a believers or the body of Christ must take this ignorance and have these individuals transformed. Listen, people in the body of Christ are ignorant because they're, they're, they don't understand who God is, not just who God is, but who they are in God because of religion and traditions of men. And when this happens, crimes run, crime runs wild. But what a wonderful thing it is for a nation to know and keep his laws. When a nation has a vision or they're not ignorant of God, crime does not run wild. And not only that, if the nation knows and keeps his law, it's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful thing. But we don't see, really see that because there is an ignorance of God. And, whether it, and even in the believer, the reason there's an ignorance is because they're not being taught truth. Or what they're being taught is a form of the truth, which still is a lie. And that lie causes them to be ignorant, right, and not understand the things of God or who they are in God or what, they're, what God has purposed in their life and, or what God can use them to do. Again, Proverbs 29, 18, just a different version. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. It's like they're running in the dark. That's why it says he has translated us, what, out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. Through the vision. Through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Through that purpose. Okay? If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble up. It's like when you, if you're saying that God has given you a ministry or an assignment, that ministry must be clear. You must have a vision, a mental vision. You must get divine revelation, divine communication, right? So that not only you, but the people that God has assigned you to or that have been assigned to assist you to fulfill this vision and ultimately the purpose of the vision, they will stumble all over themselves, right? But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. When we attend to what God reveals in a vision to us to perform that purpose in the, in the, in the area that God has called us to, we are going to be blessed and we're going to be happy. But when we have this vision, right, and we can't see what God is doing, and the vision is not plain, the, 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 the vision is not tangible, people can't get their hands on it, people can't wrap their spirit around it, people can't see where you're going, people can't see what your purpose to do, they stumble over themselves. It's like total chaos. But when they attend to what he reveals, when that vision is plain and the people can see it, and they put their hands to work at it, listen, they are most blessed. And I'm not talking about financially blessed only, but I'm talking about also spiritually blessed, emotionally blessed. Within their soulish realm, they're blessed. Everything about those people would be blessed. Okay? Whether it is, uh, 2019 Amplified Version says, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of who God is. No redemptive revelation means no understanding about what, how you can be saved. Right? Where there is no vision or how you can be saved, revelation of God, or the plan of salvation, the people perish, the people are lost, the people die and go to hell. Their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. But he, but he listen, who understands this vision, understands the redemptive process or plan and revelation of God, who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, and inevitable is he. See, this is the thing that we, have to, we, we must grasp and understand in our spirit, man. There are certain laws that God commands us to keep, which includes that of man. There are certain laws in the land that we must keep. We cannot become so spiritual, right, that we ignore the laws that man has created, right? We, don't have, we might not agree with the laws. We have to obey the laws unless the laws are contrary to the scriptures, okay? So we see all these things in, in Proverbs 29, 18. Talking about vision. Okay? Look at Acts 2, 17 and 18. Now, now we have to attack and make clear, and a lot of this is foundational teaching, but someone might not understand this. The, the foundational part of this is that God is not a respectable person, and God will give that vision to men and women. We must always clarify that in leadership training or ministry training, because there are people out there who say that women can't do this, and women can only do this, but no, that is not true. The Amplified verse said, it shall come to pass in the last days, when the last days, the last days started when Jesus left, God declares, 
This is something that God declared. Man did not do this. The Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it's infallible, right? God declares that I, who God, will pour out his spirit upon all of mankind, male and female, and your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy, telling forth the divine counsel or divine communication, divine revelation. What about when you go to counsel? Counsel is what? A person is giving you what? Instructions. They're giving you advice. So here's divine instructions and divine counsel. And your young men shall see visions, divinely granted appearances, and your old men shall dream, shall dream divinely suggested dreams, right? Yes, and on my men servants, and also on my maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall what? Prophesy, right? Telling forth the divine counsels and predicting future events pertaining especially to God's kingdom. Now, this is very, very, very important, this scripture, because what this scripture is telling us, and it's pointing to, alluding to, giving us revelation, is that prophecy should, should especially be pertaining to future events about God's kingdom. Prophecy, watch this, we're always, you hear people say, I got a word, I'm looking for the prophet to give me a word. And, and, and yes, you can get a prophetic, prophetic word. Yes, you can get a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, not just from a prophet, from anyone in the body of Christ, but especially when we start hunting down the prophetic, right? Car, house, husband, wife, job, this, that. These things don't are necessarily pertaining to the kingdom of God. Divine communication, God is not concerned about all this other stuff that we're concerned about. God is concerned about furthering his kingdom in the earth realm. That's why what these councils and these dreams and visions should be pointing to, especially the prophetic, is predicting future events pertaining especially to God's kingdom. How God's way of doing things, God's sight, God's vision, God's thinking, the heart of God. That's what this prophecy should be about. And so we hear a lot of prophecy. Well, the sky is going to fall out. The escape, all these things that we keep hearing have nothing to do with God's kingdom. And we have to try to test the spirit or try the spirit by the spirit to see if it's of God. And when we test that spirit and it does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, it is an antichrist spirit. We do not listen to that. We do not participate with it. We do not make covenant relationships with it. We ignore it or we cast it out in Jesus' name and move on with our vision for finishing out the vision and operating the purpose that God gave us. Look what it says in Habakkuk 2 and 2 through 3, the Living Bible. And the Lord said to me, write my answer on a billboard. We're talking about making the vision plain so people can see God's divine communication what God is saying, write my answer on a billboard, large and clear, right? So that anyone can read it at a glance and rush to tell others. It's not something small. It's not supposed to be a hitting mess. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, is not supposed to be a hidden message. It's supposed to be a message that everyone can see, and it's supposed to be so big and so bright and so obvious that when people see it, they don't have to stand there and with a magnifying glass. They're able to see the awesome thing of this vision and this plan that God has. It's so large and clear that anyone can read it, what, at a glance, right, and run, rush to tell others. They don't have to spend their, they shouldn't have to spend their, a lot of time trying to comprehend the vision. Trying to figure the vision out. Trying to dissect the vision. The vision should be very clear. So when they read it, they give it at a glance and they can begin to share that vision, Right? But these things I plan, but these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. When God gives you a vision for ministry or to launch something, right, there are going to be steps. There's going to be a process to eventually fulfill it its divine purpose, the completeness of it, right? And most of the time, when we're talking about ministry, that's winning souls and it shall not be completed until Jesus returns. You must leave, remember we always talk about a legacy. You must leave a legacy. Jesus left a legacy. Paul left a legacy. 
They were Paul was like told Titus, I believe in Titus, find other ordained elders in other cities. So that what? This legacy should go on. That's why it's important that we disciple and mentor future leaders and current leaders so that they can disciple and mentor others. So what? That people that they will continue to put his the, 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 the vision on a billboard, make it large and clear so people can read it at a glance. And run to tell others, even as, even as we go on to be with the Lord, this will continue. It won't happen right away, but over an extended period of time, it shall slowly come to pass. But it will be steady, and it's steady building, strip, building speed. When that vision will be filled, if it seems slow, do not do not despair. But these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. See, if this is what happens when God gives us a vision. The first thing we do is we think it's for right now in some cases. We think that if we get a vision or divine communication, the first thing we do is abandon everything we're working on, right? And we go try to do this thing, and God hasn't given it. It's not time yet. Jesus did not come into the earth realm until his appointed time. Jesus did not go out into ministry until his appointed time. Paul did not go out publicly until his appointed time. Even though Lazarus was dead in the grave, he was not raised until his what? Appointed time. The woman that had the issue of blood for 18 years, she was not healed until her what? Appointed time. The blind man of John chapter 9, who was born from birth, it was a long process, a long steady process, but he did not receive his sight until what? The appointed time. Moses did not come forth as a deliverer for the children of Israel until what? His appointed time. Joel, Habakkuk, Samuel, Elijah, none of them came forth until their what? Appointed time. The same thing is going to happen in ministry in your life. You're not, you should not come out before your time. And the way you do not come out before your time is that you seek the face of God, right? And once you get divine revelation and divine communication, you must now ask for what? Clarification. God, I hear you. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Now what? I hear you. But now there's a season for that. This is a season of training. This is a season of mentorship. This is a season of discipleship. This is a season of repentance and restoration. But it shall come to pass. And listen, and it will not be, over day, be overdue one single day. If we heed the instructions of those that God has placed into our life to mentor and disciple us, as well as the Holy Spirit. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. This is the Living Bible. But the man who isn't a Christian, right? So we start talking about the vision and making the vision plain, right? And having this vision that people can see it. Here's one of the complications or problems that we, we, we're going to encounter. And this, and this is where we make our mistake. We expect non-believers, watch this. We expect non-believers to understand the vision and catch the vision. Non-believers or the natural man, the non the unsaved cannot catch that vision. Once they receive salvation, it's a spiritually, it's a, remember, a vision, what we're talking about now, has been divinely revealed. It's divine communication, right? It, but the man who isn't a Christian can't understand it and can't accept these thoughts from God. They can't understand it. Which the Holy Spirit teaches who? Us. Who is us? The believer. Okay. They sound foolish to him because only those who have the Holy Spirit within them can understand what the Holy Spirit means. A, 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 non, a person who is not a Christian does not understand how forgiveness works. It doesn't matter what you've done to me. It doesn't matter what you've said to me. As a Christian with the Holy Spirit inside of me, I have to forgive you. It's not an option. It's part of who I am. It's how God operates and how Jesus operates. We have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to take on the characteristics of Christ. They can't understand that, right? Others just can't take it in, right? But the spiritual man has insight into what? Everything. And that bothers and baffles the man of the world who cannot understand him at all. You know, a lot of people, they walk around saying, oh, it's not that you're so spiritual, and it's not that you're so anointed. It's not that you're weird. It's not that you're peculiar. It's because you're saved. 
Because you're saved, the world does not understand you. Because you're saved, the world does not grasp nor comprehend nor come to the revelation of who you are in Christ and why we do the things we do. Because it's spiritually given, and they cannot understand that. How could he? For certainly he has never been one to know the Lord's thoughts, okay? Or to discuss them with him. How do we know the Lord's thoughts? In prayer, we discuss them with him. That's why prayer is so vital. It's a communication with the Father via the name of Jesus, okay? Or to move the hands of God by what? By prayer. But strange as it seems, we Christians actually do have within us a portion of the very thoughts and mind of Christ. This is why we have the ability to understand things that God reveals. But when we understand these things, the vision part, we must make that plain so that other believers can understand it. They grasp the concept and they run and tell others. True ministry vision must be God-inspired. A lot of times, you know, when, when God gives a vision or gets ready to do something, right, I see a lot of people that say, well, you know what, um, because I'm a good teacher in the secular world, I should be a teacher, I can be a good teacher in, in the body of Christ. No, you can't. No, you can't. That's not, that's, that, that vision, that, that has not been divinely communicated to you. Some people say, well, you know what, I'm a good singer. And I know that God wants me to sing on the praise and worship team. No, he doesn't, because you're not saved. No, he doesn't. Just because you have a gift or a talent does not mean that that's for the body of Christ. That does not mean that. And so what happens, a lot of times, we get this vision of what we should be doing based upon naturally, nat natural, uh, naturally occurring events around us or what people are saying to us. And the things that people are saying to us are not divinely inspired. But when things are divinely inspired, it shall come to pass. Not one day early. But we still must understand there is a process to this vision coming to pass. And in that process, we must go and operate in the purpose of the vision. Because the vision has a purpose. Part There's a plan that goes along with the vision. And we're going to see that. Any God-inspired vision has a plan, and it has purpose. Okay, what is purpose? To, 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 to intent, to design, to resolve, to determine on some end or object or object to be accomplished. To determine on some end or, or object or an object to be accomplished. There has to be a purpose to the vision. There has to be a purpose to the ministry. There has to be a specific purpose for the assembly. There has to be a purpose. There must be a purpose when it comes to dealing with the things of God. God does just not do anything just to be doing something. Everything that God does has a specific purpose. It has a designated end. It has a designated um, result. Okay? Purpose. That which a person sets before himself as an object to be reached or accomplished. So when God gives you a vision, and God gives ministry vision, a vision for ministry, there has to be some, a goal to be reached or something that needs to be accomplished. The end or aim to which the view is directed in any plan, measure, or exertion. We believe the supreme being, who is God, created intelligent beings, us, for some benevolent and glorious purpose. And if so, how glorious and benevolent must be his purpose in the plan of redemption. Contrary to popular belief, the purpose of the body of Christ is to execute the plan of redemption. No matter what aspect of the body of Christ you're in, the plan, the vision, and the purpose of the body of Christ is to execute the plan of redemption in some way, form, or fashion. The, the, the purpose, all right, the purpose of the body of Christ is not to, I'm going to hold, I'll hold that thought for later. 
1 John 3 8. The one persisting in sin belongs to the diabolical one or the devil. This is the voice. Who has been all about sin from when? From the beginning. That is why the Son of God came into the world, Jesus Christ, to do what? To destroy the plague of destruction inflicted on the world by the diabolical one. Or to, the other, another verse says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, to all those visions in the Old Testament and all those prophets, divine communication, for this purpose, this executed end, this thing that needs to be accomplished, this ultimate result was what? For Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Lamb that was slain without spot or blemish, his ultimate purpose was to destroy the works of the devil and restore mankind back into relationship with the Father. That has to be the purpose of every assembly and every ministry. That's the purpose. Fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers. Our job, our calling is to establish vision, certify vision, speak vision, right? God-inspired vision, right? And, and help people reach their purpose and understand what their purpose is. Give them the tools. Give them the power and make them understand where the power comes from. Make them understand where the patience and the long-suffering comes from to accomplish that task. And the ultimate, the ultimate goal is to win souls. We must rethink ministry. Proverbs 2018, The Voice. Plans are finalized on the basis of good counsel. So only go to war when you have wise instructions. So when you're trying to resolve purpose and figure out how to, how to bring something to pass that God has given you divine communication and revelation about, you need to seek counsel. Now there's a couple ways you can seek counsel. One, through prayer and fasting. You can receive divine counsel. Two, there, the Bible says there's, counsel in the, there's, there's wisdom in the counsel of the multitude of the elders and the prophets and the apostles. And you get together, and you sit down, and you reason. You let the Holy Spirit speak and give us counsel and give us what? Instructions or directions. But you must understand, we, we're, we're in warfare. We're going to have to go to war. You are going to have to war to make that purpose come to pass, to fulfill, its, to, to, to fulfill the thing that God wants it to do. But God has to use you, and God has to use me, and God has to use this woman, and God has to use that man. But it has to come to pass. It's God's desire that it comes to pass. And without you, certain things are not going to come to pass. And some of the things that we think that God has called us to do, God has not called us to do nor purposed us to do. These are things that we've thought about doing our own selves. It seems good. It makes some money, right? And it makes our flesh feel good. But God never called us to do it. Never. Again, James 1 and 5, the Living Bible. If you want to know God, what God wants you to do, if God, if you got it, you have a divine communication through a vision. Remember, ministry, vision, and purpose. You get the vision. Now, God, here's this purpose. What do you want me to do? If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask Him. That's simple, and He will gladly tell you. For He is always ready to give a bountiful supply of what wisdom to all who ask Him. He will not resent it. It amazes me that people. Walk around in ministry and assemblies trying to figure out what to do and the person that they say gave them the vision, the person that gave them the divine, gave them instructions, the, the person that locks them, put them out the way, put them in, start them on the way, they never ask for instructions. They never ask for wisdom. God wants you to ask them because God wants you to get it right the first time. But we won't ask God. We'll go to seminars. We'll go to conferences. We'll buy books. We'll buy tapes, we'll buy CDs. And ultimately, all you have to do is ask the Father. Father, I need wisdom. How do you want me to do this? When do you want me to do this? Who do you want to be with me? Who do you want me to see to get answers? Who do you want me to be accountable to? Who do you want me to sit at? Whose feet do you want me to sit at? So I'll understand what you're saying and what you want me to do. But we never do that. And the reason we don't do that is because it's pride arrogance, and ignorance. It's pride because we don't want people to think we don't know anything. 
It's arrogance because we think we know everything, and it's ignorant because we're never going to fulfill our purpose, and it becomes frustrating. And that is why so many people leave ministry all monthly. That is why so many people, on multiple levels, people in ministry are on drugs. People in ministry commit suicide. People of ministry have, are turning away from Christianity to other religions. Because of pride, arrogance, and ignorance. James 1, 5, voice. If you don't have all the wisdom needed for this journey, for your purpose, from the vision you receive, then all you have to do is what? Ask God for it. And God will grant you all that you need. He gives lavishly and never scolds you for asking. You know, my own personal experience is once I had a vision, I received a vision, a divine communication from God about what he wanted me to do. I didn't tell anyone. I was praying about it. I was fasting about it. And then I went and, 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 and someone prophetic gift confirmed exactly what God said. Now I have double divine communication. Now what do I do now? How do I get this thing started? What do I do? I didn't go around asking people. I asked God. Fasting and prayer and studying God's word. And as you fast and pray and study God's word, God speaks through that prayer. God speaks through that fasting. God speaks through his word. And as God speaks through the prayer, God speaks through the fasting, God speaks through his word, you begin to write it down. You begin to write the vision down. You begin to write the ult the ultimately the thing that God wants you to accomplish. And then you begin to ask God, okay, God, this is what you want me to do. You want me to launch a ministry, God, that, that for, for leaders? I don't know anything about that. He said, study my word, son. I studied God's word. He said, now study the word some more. I studied the word. He said, now pray it fast. I prayed it fast. And then I began to get divine revelation and divine communication on how to do things. I'm not the smartest person in the world. I would actually say that. But God has blessed me with insight. Insight and divine revelation and divine communication on how to help leaders be successful in the body of Christ. How to operate in their purpose. How to operate in their destiny. How to understand the vision that God has given them. How to be profitable to the kingdom of God. That's something that God dropped in my spirit last year. That we must be profitable to the kingdom. That means we must produce for the kingdom. If you put a dollar bill in a savings account and it never makes any money, it never brings you an in, a, a return, it's not profitable. It's not profiting you anything to have in that account. But if you move it to another form of investment and it begins to bring you a return, it is now profitable. God wants you to be profitable. God wants me to be profitable. How? He wants us to win souls into the kingdom. Then he wants us to mature those souls so that those souls can go out and win more souls. We must abandon some of these ideas and plans and schemes and skits that we have manufactured from our flesh and from ungodly men and women who will sabotage your vision, who will sabotage your purpose for their own pleasure and their own purpose. This is why it's so important that we have communication and are in covenant relationships with other people that can speak into our lives that we know are mature and full of the Holy Ghost. God doesn't get mad. That's how we attain wisdom. The purpose of every ministry, contrary to popular belief, there is a purpose for every ministry that God has birthed through vision. Every ministry. If you look at every Old Testament prophet, everything always pointed to Jesus. It was always calling the people what? Back to God. Every time the church of Israel strayed off, here comes a vision. Back to God. Every time when it's time for Jesus to come, what are people doing? They're given insight, divine communication. The Messiah is coming. The anointed one is coming. And when he comes, he's going to set things in order. He's going to bring us back to God. Always the same thing. There was none of this, um, 
trying to make us socially acceptable. There was none of this trying to make us politically correct. Jesus never addressed political issues. The only thing Jesus ever did from a political standpoint is he paid his taxes. When he said, render unto Caesar, which is Caesar's. But everything else always was his focus and his concern and his purpose was the kingdom, being profitable to the kingdom. In John, he talks about how all those that God had given him, he had not lost one. Not one. Because he maintained his purpose. He did not get sidetracked with the trends of the day. He did not try get sidetracked with the big conference of the day. He did not get sidetracked with the great thing that people call the new and hot and hip thing to do in ministry. He didn't do that. He stayed on course for Calvary. What I like about that scripture talks about if you put your hand to the plow and you look back and you're not fit for the kingdom. You know what that's really saying? That if you put your hand and start your purpose and you start doing other things other than what God has purposed for your life and that assembly of your ministry, you're not fit for the kingdom. We have to mind our business and stay in our lane. And how do we do that? We seek God for wisdom. We seek for revelation knowledge. We're always looking for divine communication from God. And it can come via the Holy Spirit. It can come from a person with a word of wisdom or word of knowledge. But we shouldn't go seeking that. We should always be seeking instructions from the one who sent us, God. Here's what it is. This is the purpose of every ministry and ultimately every assembly in the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 18, the voice. All of this is a gift from our creator God, who has pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with him through the anointed. Talking about Jesus. And he has given us the same mission. He gave this mission to Jesus. Now God is giving us the same mission. And what is that mission? The mission of reconciliation to bring others back to him. That's it. That is the purpose. That should be the purpose of every ministry. But how you execute that has been given in a, in a vision. And the vision is how God speaks to you. And then you get the wisdom to execute the vision. Ultimately, this is the purpose of it. The, 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 the end, the expected end, or the objective of every ministry and assembly, every believer, every leader, is to operate in the operation of the ministry of reconciliation that, we, that we've already been reconciled through the anointed one, now, he's given us the same mission. He's not giving us a different mission. He's not giving us a different purpose. But what he has did is, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation to bring others back to him. And what he's done is, the only difference is, he might give us a different group of people to go after. Paul, the Gentiles. Peter, the Jews. Your, your, your purpose might be to bring those back to him who are homeless. Your purpose over here might be over here and bring the widows and the orphans to him. Your purpose might be over to make sure that the sick and shut in come to him and grow in him. Your purpose might be to go to those that are in jail and bring them back to him and mature them. But the ultimate purpose of every ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. It's not to get people to vote for a president. It, it, it's, not, it's not to set up daycares. It's not to start businesses. It's not. That's man's plan. That's man's vision. That is not God's vision. It's not to use the kingdom, right, as a scapegoat or as a place to make money. That's not, that's not what it's for. If that was the case, Jesus would have not objected to them selling doves as, as um, sacrifices in the temple. See, we forget all of that. Because you know why? Because that, 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 that's tight. That's truth. That calls us to a place of accountability. This is what the purpose of every ministry should be. Is to bring people back to him. And if we don't know how to do it, he gives us revelation knowledge. But we should just ask for wisdom.
It's going to get good. Right? God calls his pastors and his people to this incredible, and I believe that when I'm talking about everyone, but more so we're talking about pastors and ministry leaders right now, to this incredible ministry of reconciliation, as though God himself were doing it through them. Okay? We saw it in 2 Corinthians, right? All the fullness of God dwells in his shepherd and his people. All the fullness of God dwells in us through Christ and the Holy Spirit, right? All God's great salvation is in the hands of his people. Listen, we are the only ones that can win souls to Christ into the kingdom. We're the only ones. Jesus did his part when he, when he was a sacrifice. Now he turns it over to us. Now it's our turn. That's what we should be focused on. We spend too much time focusing on nonsense. We just spend too, in the body of Christ, we spend too much time focusing on all these other things, right, other than the ministry of reconciliation. Because the ministry of reconcilia reconciliation changes the dynamics of how we act and how we see ourselves. We no longer see ourselves as the leader, but we have to see ourselves as a follower, as a servant, as a bond slave to Christ. And people can't handle that. One of the things that, 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 I, that I discovered in the last couple of days, revelation knowledge, is that the reason a lot of people in the body of Christ cannot come and operate in their purpose and the vision for their life is because they have spiritual low self-esteem. They have spiritual low self-esteem. And the reason they have spiritual low self-esteem is because we look at all these well-known uh, preachers, we look at all these big ministries, and we look at people around us who are very spiritual, and they seem to be having it going on, and we feel that God has favored them more than us, and that they have some special connection with God that I will never have because of my background, the sin that I committed. My last name, the color of my skin, I was born out of wedlock. No, watch this. The same blood. Jesus did not, did not have VIP, he did not shed VIP blood for some people. And then the mid, then, then economy class blood for other people. He shed his blood. And that same blood that was shed for me was shed for you. That same blood that was shed for me was shed for Billy Graham. That same blood that was shed for me was shed for Smith Wigglesworth. That same blood that was shed for me was shed for every believer. And in God's sight, we are all equal. There is no respect of persons. And so because we allow ourselves to become spiritually, right? We allow ourselves to have this spiritually low self-esteem based upon religion and the traditions of men and people operating in pride and arrogance, we feel that we can never accomplish anything great for the kingdom. But the only thing you have to do to accomplish something great is do what God tells you to do in your sphere of influence, in your little patch. Just fulfill your purpose. The vision that God has given you, make it plain. Let it be big enough for people to see so they can look at a glance, run with it, tell others about it. Stop having all these meetings and conferences trying to figure out. The Bible has told us what we should be doing. And he's given us all the tools to get it done. God's good news to a broken world has been given to his people to proclaim freely to all people. What did Jesus say? He opened the book. I have come to what? Mend the broken heart. He came to heal the sick, cast out demons and devils, restore people back to God. Ministry of reconciliation. What did Paul spend all his time doing? Getting people saved. After they got saved, maturing them. Ministry of reconciliation. What did the apostles do in the beginning of Acts? They preached Jesus. Thousands were added to the church daily. The ministry of reconciliation. They begin to serve one another. No one ever had lacked anything. The ministry of reconciliation. Other people saw that vision. 
Other people didn't understand it at first, but they saw what was going on in those New Testament little assemblies. What happened? They got it. They went and told other people. Added to the church daily. Why? Because they focused on the ministry of reconciliation. Bringing the lost men and women or lost mankind back into relationship with the Father. All this other stuff that we spend our time doing and focusing on is absurd. You know, we always, just like we saw earlier about how people run wild and crime is wild. The reason it's been is because we are trying to make unsaved people, unspiritual people, operate in the spiritual things of God. And it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. And that's why you have so many people just sitting in assemblies doing nothing, still confused, still lost, still broken, still bound, because we are letting them come in there and we're doing all these, playing all these religious games and all these programs and little cliques and schisms and clubs, right, to make them feel comfortable and they're dead. Dead man walking, dead man, dead woman walking, dead boy walking, dead girl walking. They're dying, they're going to be dying in their sins and go straight to hell and eventually the lake of fire because we are not being truthful. We're not dealing with what the issue is. And we're going to see what the issue is in a minute. Romans 5 and 20, the Living Bible says, The Ten Commandments were given so that all could see the, the extent of their failure to obey God's laws. That was the purpose of the Ten Commandments. That we could see, right, to the extent of our failure or their failure in time to obey God's laws. But the more we see our sinfulness, the more we see God's abounding grace forgiving us. We have to make people see their sin. And that make them understand that the more we see how, how sinful we are, the more we should be able to see God's abounding grace and his mercy, his unmerited favor, and understand the redemptive plan that he used Jesus to complete. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Listen, the whole Bible, not parts of it, the whole Bible, the whole word of God was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. And not just our lives, right? But other people's lives. Not being judgmental because we're not judging a person. What we're doing is we're, we have, first of all, we have to compare our own life to the, to the Word of God, which is a Bible, not an iPad, not a tablet. It's a Bible. Right? What is, what is true and, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us to do what? What is right. The Bible. Without the Bible, a person cannot be straightened out and they're not going to do right. Maybe in their own eyes, they're doing right. Maybe in their own mind, they're doing right. But truthfully, they can. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point. Fully equipped to do, to do good to what? Everyone. This word of God is the thing that it takes for us to operate in a ministry of reconciliation. Someone writing a book on wisdom principles is not going to help you. You need wisdom? Ask God. God gives us instructions. If we would, you know, it's amazing to me, and in my own life sometimes too, how I just, I'm like aimless sometimes. And then it hits me. Why am I aimless? I have a Father in Heaven who one thing I have to do is communicate with Him. And when I communicate with Him with, 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 with repentance and a sincere heart and a sincere desire to be obedient, He speaks profoundly. And he doesn't take it all day. Not weeks upon end, months, a whole lifetime. He speaks. And he speaks clearly with, with divine instruction. Through divine communication. Ultimately, here's the issue. Sin is the issue. Sin is the issue, right, that has caused this dilemma in the earth. Start in the Garden of Eden. 
and it has continued up until today. But you know what the problem is? We don't talk about sin. We don't address sin as the root cause of people's problems. We've come up with all these other ideas and all these other philosophies and all these ways of doing it and blaming it on someone else. But ultimately, sin is the issue, and I'm going to show you how sin is the issue. The Manual of Operation for the Christian Wartime Mentality is the Bible. It was inspired and authorized by the commander, God, and contains all the truth needed to win people over from the enemy camp, ministry of reconciliation, deprogram their old thought patterns, worldly lifestyles, train them in the strategies of righteousness, the things of God, kingdom thinking, think kingdom living, and equip them with armor and weapons to defeat Satan and liberate his captives. The whole armor of God. Sin is the issue. And sin has to be addressed. That is the purpose of ministry of reconciliation. To address sin. To expose sin. And make people understand that their sinful nature has separated them from God. And keeps them separated from God. And the only way they're going to make it and have a relationship with him is through Jesus. We've abandoned talking about sin. We've abandoned it. We've abandoned calling sin, sin. We've abandoned talking to people, counseling people, and calling sin, sin. We call it everything else dysfunctional. If something is dysfunctional, I can tell you we can trace it back to the root of sin. If someone is acting out, we can always trace it back to some sin. Always. The other day I was, I was praying... Um, and I, I have been praying about how to address a certain situation with, with, with a person that I know. And as I was praying, I had already got revelation from God about what the problem was and what I need to be praying about. But then as I sat there, I was reading, 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 and I just happened to flip through the channels, and two young ladies were talking. And they were like on a radio show, both of them were women of God, I, I discerned that. And you know what they were saying? And this is not to jump on the bad wagon, but they happened, the, 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 uh, the, the interviewer asked them about um, some of their experiences as they've been traveling around the country talking with people, young people. And the one lady said that she was in one country where you could not uh, call homosexuality sin. You could be arrested for that. And then she said through her own experiences, all her life, the reason she, was, she had been in homosexuality or, or a lesbian was because she had been molested and abused by men over a course of years. And because of that, she had lost her natural affection for men and gravitated towards women because of the abuse. Sin is the thing that caused her to go into that lifestyle because someone sinned against her and they abused her. The root of her problem was not that she sinned at the beginning, but because someone sinned and someone sinned against her. Any problems that we deal with 99.9% of .9 our lives and in people's lives, sin is the root cause. And we don't want to call it that. We want to call it all these other issues, but sin is the root cause. Jesus dealt with sickness, right? Jesus said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. The woman that was taking adultery. He didn't say, he didn't, he didn't use the excuse, oh, you know, you didn't have a father. Oh, you didn't have a mother. Oh, this happened. He said, no. Where are your accusers? Well, they're not here now. Though. But then he always said, go and sin no more. But we can't say that. We're, we're too afraid. We operate in fear. People in ministry now, leaders, pastors, operate in fear. We operate in fear that because we tell the truth, we're not going to get a speaking engagement. We're not going to go here and have this church with the, all the members that give a lot of money come over for the pastor's anniversary or the choir anniversary or the usher's anniversary or, 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 or kids' day or the harvest festival. That has nothing to do with the ministry of reconciliation. You didn't see Paul and then Paul doing none of that. You didn't see Jesus doing none of that. 
But see, our minds have to be, listen, we have to have the mind of Christ, and our minds need to be regenerated and washed with the Word of God daily. We need to walk in the Spirit and be led of the Spirit and not walk in the flesh and be led by our flesh. And as we study the Word of God, we need to understand that the Word of God is true. It's quick, it's powerful, it's like a two-edged sword. Cuts going in, cuts coming out, but as it cut, it's cutting the sin out of our lives. See? It says it right here. Deprogram their old thought pattern. Train them in strategies of righteousness and equip them. This is what the ministry of reconciliation, this is what it looks like. This is the battle plan. This is how we accomplish the task. This is how we turn lawless, lawless people into law-abiding citizens. This is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to take to restore our families. This is what it's going to take to restore the integrity and character of ministries. This is what it's going to take to ensure the to the, to, uh, to bring back the reputation of ministry leaders in our communities, in our local assemblies. Yes, anyone can fall. But ultimately, we have to operate in the ministry of reconciliation. That has to be our main focus. All ministry leaders, first and foremost, will deal with the awful reality of sin. We have to deal with sin. We cannot abandon it. We cannot say, oh, it doesn't exist. Oh, we can't say that. It, I'm not going to discuss it. I'm not going to call it out. But everything when we call them dealing with sin, we have to do what? In love. We must learn to speak the truth in love, not out of anger, not out of a hidden agenda, not out of a way of thinking more highly of ourselves than we are. Right? Sin in their own lives, in our own lives, and sin in the people of God. And sin in the multitude of the lost people around them. Let's look at that again. All ministry leaders must deal with the awful reality. Sin is an awful reality. Sin separates us from God. It separates us from the Father. Right? First of all, it has to start at home. I first must be, I first must have to deal with sin in my own life. I can't spend all my time talking about your sin and that and this, and I'm not, I'm not prepared to deal with the sin in my own life. And let me sidebar that. I am so thankful that I have a pastor that loves me and that she is not afraid to speak the truth in love. And yes, it can cut. But I'm a better person for it. We all need that type of leadership. We all need that type of accountability. And we all need that type of mentoring and discipleship. Where people will speak the truth in love. And deal, help us deal with this awful reality of sin in our life. But as soon as someone starts telling us we got a nasty attitude. We operate in bitterness and unforgiveness. We start, we go on the defensive. Been there, done that. But at the end of the day, when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and hearken until the voice that God is using to speak to us and correct us and instruct us in righteousness, we're better for it. Sin in our own lives, sin in the, listen, now watch this. Sin in the lives of the people of God. The Bible says if a person says he has no sin, the li he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. And here I'm talking, and listen, that was not addressed to unbelievers, that was addressed to believers. So any person you say, say, I don't have any sin, they are, they are a liar, and the truth is not in them. And sin in the multitude of the lost people around them. It's amazing what the process is. First, we have to deal with the sins in our own life, in my own life as a leader. Second, I have to help the people of the people of God deal with the sin in their lives. Then, we got to go deal with the sins in the multitude of the lost people around, around us. Why? Because it's a process. I deal with mine. I help you deal with yours. Now you're better equipped to have someone deal with theirs. It's a process. No life or ministry can know victory, success, and joy that ignores the reality of sin and God's solution and provision for sin. That was Henry T. Blackman. No ministry, no life or ministry, right, can no victory, success, and joy that ignores the reality of sin and God's solution and provision for sin. Why? 
because you're not the, 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 the you're not it's not going to be satisfying. There's going to be something lacking. And I hear people tell me, there's, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. There's something not right going on in the ministry. We've tried this. We've tried that. We're praying and we're fasting. If you're praying and fasting with a sincere heart, you're going to know what the problem is. And most of the problem usually is we're not dealing with the sin issue in the lives of ourselves, the people of God, and we definitely can't help the lost world if we can't even deal with it in our own life. Charity begins at home. Here. We have to deal with sin. Plain and simple. We have to deal with sin. We have to root it out. We have to deal with sin. Because if we fail to deal with sin, we are not going to accomplish the purpose. It's not going to happen. First Timothy 115. This is Paul. Excuse me. This is a faithful saying, the word of all exception, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The, he said he understood the ministry of reconciliation, the Apostle Paul. But what did he do? He said, This is faithful, you can count on it. A saying, the word of all exception, you better accept this. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save what? He didn't come to build daycares. He didn't come for you to get a private jet. He didn't come for you to all this other social activities we get involved in. He came to save sinners. And Paul said, let me start with myself, of whom I'm the chief. I'm at the top of the list. He, he acknowledged he was a sinner himself. But look at all the things that he wrote and all the things that God used him to accomplish and all the lives he changed and impacted and still is by his writing or the divine communication revelation that God gave him. Because he never abandoned and never forgot that, hey, he died for me, I'm a sinner. And the same blood that Jesus shed for Paul, he shed for you and me. Here's God's wholeness, God's answer. God wants every man, woman, boy, girl to be whole. That's, vision, that's the vision and purpose of your ministry or assembly. God's answer is wholeness. Pastors and ministry leaders are primary, primarily, are, are, are responsible primarily to deal with sin as Jesus was. Jesus' message in his day was repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near you. As you see, my normal um, editor was not helping. You. Didn't get on this one. Jesus' message in his day was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near you. Jesus didn't say, come join the church. Jesus didn't say, come sing on the choir. Jesus didn't say, God's going to give you a new house. Jesus didn't say, you know, the, 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 I have the anointing to prosper. Jesus didn't say, you're going to get a new business. Jesus didn't say. Jesus said, repent, turn, and go in the opposite direction. For the kingdom of heaven is near you. He just said, basically, I'm standing right here. I'm standing right here. That, he dealt with that. He dealt with sin. He dealt with the, he dealt with the, the root cause of sin. The devil. Demonic spirit, influence. He dealt with that. We don't deal with that. We're scared to deal with demons. We're scared to deal with familiar spirits. We're scared to pray in public. We're scared to call it what it is, what it is. Jesus went right on his business. He encountered something, bam, kept moving. Paul, bam, kept moving. Our minds have to go back to the foundational teaching of the apostles and the prophets. We must go back to the vision and purpose of the New Testament church, starting the book of Acts, and progressively look at all the epistles and letters and instructions that were given to the New Testament church and how successful they were. Were they flawless? No, but they were successful. And if we look at that blueprint of what made them successful, and because it's God ordained, God and God uh, sanction, we will be successful as well. Won't it be a shame if you, you did here to get someone, help someone get healed or 
You did cast out a demon. A miracle was worked at your hands, and then God said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I know you not. Because he gave us a dream, he gave us a vision, he gave us divine revelation and communication. And instead of us following that through, we decided that, that purpose and plan didn't fit our own personal agenda. So we deviated from that purpose and that plan. We deviated from the plan of reconciliation. Excuse me, the ministry of reconciliation. We deviated from that. We always start out with good intentions. Good intentions will get you in trouble. Good planning will save you. Good counsel will lead you in the right direction. Jesus' message was, and his day was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near you. People don't even tell people to repent. This was Jesus' call. Turn from your sin. It is destroying you. It's ruining you. Either physically or emotionally or spiritually or all three. Turn to heaven's full provision for your sin. The kingdom of heaven is right next to you. I'm here. Tangible. I'm here. Trust God to cleanse you and make you whole. Trust Him. Have faith in God. The other day I realized something. The Bible does not say, the Bible does not say believe in your head. It says believe in your heart. Your head can be enemy with your heart. But if you believe in your heart that God raises from Jesus from the dead and confesses with you shall be saved. Not your head, your heart. Not your head, your heart. All through Jesus' ministry, people who believed him, who trusted him enough to call on him to heal them, were made whole immediately or within the same hour. Anyone that came to Jesus, that believed on him, relied upon him, trusted him enough to call on him to heal them and make them whole, were made whole immediately or within the same hour. What's our excuse? This is the ministry that Jesus left us. He did not leave us powerless. He said, after the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall have power. Cast out demons. Pick up serpents. None of hurt me. Oh, by any means hurt you. Raise the dead. He gave us power. He gave us the same power that he had to accomplish the ministry of reconciliation. We have no power in our lives. We, we operate in fear of man. We operate in fear of the government. We operate in fear as believers. In this country, we operate in fear. In fear. We're ashamed to talk about God and Jesus. On our jobs, in our homes, around our friends, we're ashamed. Why? Because we want to fit in with the world. We want what the world has. We want accolades, and we want to be accepted. We want to be part of the crowd, part of the game. But remember, that can cost you your name being written, being written in the Lamb's Book of Life, written in one of those other books. Look at Jesus' call. That was his call. When pastors or ministry leaders, or when a pastor or ministry leader is persuaded by sociologists and human reasoning that the world and its logic will work, that ministry will be full of stress and failure. When pastors and ministry leaders are persuaded that sociologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and all that the world's reason has to offer and its logic will work, that ministry, you can't, you can't use worldly, worldly, worldly ideology to deal with spiritual issues. It's not going to work. And this is why we have so many people in the body of Christ who are in trouble. Because pastors and leaders are trying to use sociology and, and human reasoning and logic to deal with spiritual issues. It will not work. That's why our ministries are failing, left and right, every day. We've abandoned the power of the Holy Spirit. We've abandoned the name of Jesus. We've, been, been, we've abandoned holiness and fasting and prayer and sanctification. We've abandoned all that. Understand that we've been set apart for God's work. We've abandoned all that because we try to use sociology and human reasoning and logic and Scientology 
and motivational speaking, and if I think good thoughts, if I think good thoughts, I'm going to end up in hell, but i got to believe in my heart. It's all relevant to where we're at today. Ministry vision and purpose. Listen, here's God's sophisticated in dealing with sin. Jesus, listen, watch this. Jesus ne never made referrals to anyone else. When I say that, it's not that you go to the doctor and you have a, a, a health care provider, a nurse practitioner, and they're, they're not qualified to help you. What do they do? They write you out a referral step. Well, maybe you need to go over here to the cardiologist, or maybe you need to go to an orthopedic specialist, or maybe you need to go to an eye, ear, nose, and throat, or maybe you need to go to a podiatrist, or maybe you know you need to go to an orthopedic surgeon, or maybe, maybe you need to go to a chiropractor, neurologist. All these things, that's how, but in the body of Christ, Jesus never made referrals to anyone else. He dealt with the problem. He was equipped to deal with it. He and his father were present to bring all the help they needed. Right? We should never make a referral when sin is the problem. We should deal with it. See, we should never, we should not be sending people other places to get made whole and deal with their sin. Pastors. If you say you're a pastor and you and, 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 and you have a sheep, you should see in, in real life, the shepherd handled all the sheep's problems on a farm. He didn't refer the sheep off somewhere else. The, the, path, the shepherd learned how to make keep the sheep healthy and whole. That's what they did. And sometimes you say, you know, that's just too much for me to deal with. You know why? Because you're not seeking wisdom. When I'm not a counselor, no. You're part of it. You're, you, you are part, you're not a counselor, no. You're a child of God. You've been bought with a price. You don't have a right just to do with your body what you want to do with it. God gives us instruction on how we to handle situations. I know I know to be like this is man, I'm not crazy. I understand what I'm saying completely. We have to deal with sin. We should not be referring people to psychiatrists when we know they got a demon. Cast it out. Take authority. We know that when people are sick and the, and the root cause is unforgiveness and bitterness, lead them to repentance. When we know that people have e e emotional issues because of childhood trauma, lead them to repentance and wholeness. Deal with the sin. Expose the sin with love. God's resources are available, sufficient and powerfully effective. God's resources never have been, never fail. Any person that's ever went to God knows that if we go with a pure heart and the right intentions, God has never failed us in any situation or circumstance in our life. I, for me, that's my testimony. God has never, I've failed God numerous times. But God has never failed me. Never has never failed me. Never failed me whatsoever. He's always provided. He's always been honest. He's always been forthright. He's always been patient and kind and loving. But he's always been truthful. Never refer someone to the world when you know God can provide. Psalm 50 and 15, the Living Bible. What I want from you is your true thanks. I want your promises fulfilled. I want you to trust me in your times of trouble so I can rescue you and you can give me glory. That's what God wants. He wants us to call upon him in the time. He wants us to lead people to him. Sin is the issue. Sin is the issue. We must go back to dealing with sin. We must go back to the foundation teachings of the apostles and the prophets, looking at how the New Testament church was established. What were those protocols? What were those things that they practiced and did that were effective when people were added to the church daily? This is what we must return to, ladies and gentlemen. Pastor, 
elder, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, deacon. It's relevant. Bishop, it's relevant. We must stop spending our time, spending our wills, trying to come up with worldly strategies to deal with spiritual issues. My closing thought, but before I give you that thought, I want Here's my closing thought for tonight. How much honor has been denied our Lord when we make referrals to the world and do not call on Him? How much honor have we denied Him who sacrificed Himself on the cross for us when we make referrals to the world and do not call on Him? How much honor have we denied Him? How many people have died and are going to end up hell and lake of fire because we've denied Jesus, our Lord, and sent them to a world, something in the world that could not help them? It was just a temporary fix. It was a temporary fix, but their soul was lost. How many? Who are we dealing with right now in our life? That sin is the issue and we won't tell, tell the truth. Who of us has sin in our life and we're not acknowledging that sin and we're not dealing with that sin? Who? Who amongst us? All of us. All of us. Tonight I want to thank you for tuning in on this session. We're Powerhouse Ministries, P.O. Box 1, Cary, North Carolina, 27512. Here, if you're watching us live, we're on Ustream and the YouTube channels, the Powerhouse 1. Our website is www.onepowerhouse.org, and our email address is powertemple at mindspring.com. I'm going to pray here in a minute. But I just want you to take the time, if you're watching with us live tonight, thank you. If you watch it later again, God bless you. But I want you to take the time tonight and just sit in a still, quiet place. And I want you to evaluate your life, your ministry, the vision, your purpose. I want you to really, really do some self-examination tonight. I'm going to do some. And just think about how good God has been to us, been to you, been to me, been to our families, provided for us, taken care of us. And the simple thing he asked us to do is to share him with the dying world. That's all. He doesn't ask us to cut off our arms and do all these other things that other religious people do. He just asks us to use our voices and our lives as living testimonies to him. Are you a leader tonight or who's watching this at some point and you're saying, I have a vision. God gave me a vision, divine communication, divine revelation, divine, and I'm trying to fulfill my purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. Tonight, your purpose is the ministry of reconciliation. I have sin in my life tonight, and I don't, I, I, I don't know how, to, I don't know what I need to do to get that sin out of my life. Repent. Find, find someone. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. I believe that's what it says. I don't want to take it out of context because some people really, they'll go crazy if I say it wrong. But I'll paraphrase that. Confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Find someone that you, have, that you can trust, that's a mature, spirit-filled believer, leader. Confess your sin. Let them pray with you. Let them pray for you. So that you can be healed. Don't miss this opportunity tonight. Or whenever you see this. If you see this. To be made whole. Will thou be made whole? Because until you're made whole. There are, there's always going to be this second guessing. Of what your purpose and destiny is. And what your the vision is. Did God tell me that? Didn't God tell me that? Is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this not what I'm supposed to do? 
Because the enemy is always going to hold you hostage based upon that sin in your life. I had a passage to say, tell it, say it. Because once you're able to confess it yourself, you release yourself from it. Confess it. Be made whole tonight in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you tonight. Father, I thank you tonight for the ministry of reconciliation. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. I thank you tonight, Father, for the name of your Son, Jesus. But, Father, I thank you that tonight you've given us an opportunity to examine ourselves. Even like on when they do communion, they break his body and we eat it and we drink his blood. He said, let us examine our own selves first. So, Father, I want to examine myself tonight. I pray, Father, that you reveal the sin in my life, God, the sin that I, that, I, that I am denying within myself, the sin that I keep saying is not there. I pray tonight, Father, that I will be delivered, set whole, and made free in Jesus' name. Father, for those that are viewing tonight or might view in the future, I pray for them right now in the name of Jesus that sin would be eradicated from their life. That they would confess that sin, that they would turn and go into, repent and go in the opposite direction, Father. That based upon the name of Jesus, God, they would be delivered, made whole, and set free tonight. That yoke of bondage would come off of them, God. That they would be free to do your will and your way and fulfill that purpose, God. That they would feel confident to come to you and ask for direction and for guidance, God, and for wisdom on how to fulfill that purpose. I thank you, God, that because of some sin in our lives, God, illness has been, the enemy has used that to take root, get, put illness in our life. And tonight, God, I cast that illness out. I cast that unforgiveness out. I cast that bitterness and that hate and that strife and that backbiting and that gossiping and that lasciviousness and that reveling. I cast it out now in the name of Jesus. Father, we now deny the works of the flesh, God, and we celebrate the name of Jesus and, and operate and to, and to be led by the Spirit. Father, we pray that love would be manifested and temperance and patience and long-suffering would be manifested in our lives tonight as leaders, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity to stand before your people and declare this word and teach this word and share this word as you gave it to me, God, with revelation knowledge and through divine communication. I thank you now, God, that there are leaders that are being birthed tonight somewhere in this world, God, that will follow your plan, that will be obedient, God, that are struggling right now, God, with, with clarification on what they should be doing and how they should do it. But, Father, tonight, I pray that you would answer their prayer, God, that you would clearly speak to them and reveal to them, God, that vision and that purpose for their life and that ministry and that assembly. Father, that pastor, that leader, God, that has gone astray tonight, that has abandoned the, the purpose of, in, in the ministry of reconciliation, we pray now, Father, that they would repent, and go in the right direction, God, and get back on track, Father. We pray, God, that they will be restored to that place of leadership, God, to that place of accountability, to a place of integrity, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you now, God, for that family that's been destroyed because of sin. Tonight, God, we pray that they're healed and made whole and brought back together as a family, God. We thank you now, God, for that ministry, that assembly, where there's strife going on now about who's in control, that whoever's the orchestrating about being in control, God, they would recognize that that's sin, and they would abandon that sin, confess that sin, and repent of that sin, God, so that that assembly might, might, might be productive and that souls might be added to the kingdom and the church daily. Father, we thank you tonight for the name of Jesus, because at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. We thank you now, Father, that you love the world so much that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you, God, that tonight you're going to expose the sin in our lives. We thank you, God, that you're going to expose the sin in the people's lives that we mentor and disciple, God. Not for, not for our ability to think more highly of ourselves and our God, that, that we would know how to pray for them, how to intercede for them, God. And when the appropriate time comes, God, that we would know how to talk with them, God, and share with them your heart that you placed in us, your spirit that you placed in us tonight, God. We thank you now, God, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, God, that gives us power in this supernatural prayer language to communicate directly to you without any inhibitions or interruptions from the enemy. Father, we thank you tonight 
for all the gifts of the Spirit. We thank you tonight, God, for that gift of apostle that you've given to mankind, that gift of the prophet, that gift of the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. We thank you for all those things, God, that you've given to this, to the body of Christ, God, that we might be proficient and we might be productive and profitable to your kingdom. We thank you tonight, Father. Now, God, I pray for every leadership team that I'm in connection with and fellowship with, God, that tonight that you would bless them, restore them, give them fresh insight, revelation knowledge, and fresh divine communication, God, that they would hear you clearly. Father, we love you tonight, and we acknowledge that you are our sovereign God. And without you, we can do nothing. But in your son's name, and with you orchestrating our bit, the vision and the purpose, we can, all, we can do all things but fail. Thank you tonight again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. I hope you learned something. I hope you received some revelation, knowledge, confirmation, conviction, not condemnation, but conviction. That God loves us enough that he will speak to right where we are, to our hearts and our minds. And he will call us back to a place of repentance and reconciliation with him. God bless you and thank you for tuning in.